So, tell me what happened. I was there. They crucified him. I can show you where they buried him. What difference does it make at this point? I understand. But just start from the beginning. Well... It was amazing. A few years back, a guy shows up making all kinds of crazy claims. He spent most of his time at the river. That's where I would go to listen. Then one afternoon, he just stops. Mid-sentence points and says, Look! So we all looked. Look, he said. The Lamb of God. <laughs> just what we all needed, right? A lamb? That's the first time I saw him. The lamb, that is. Jesus. Jesus as well. I was for three years, right up until, well, yesterday. It was amazing. He was amazing. And the crowds, oh, I've never seen so many people in one place. And it was everywhere, everywhere we went. More crowds. They came to listen, they came to watch, some came to criticize others to be healed and he touched he touched untouchable people and and they were healed I'm not sure I understand he was healing people but you seem offended he told a man his sins were forgiven people are so naive only God can forgive sin his followers made mockery of the law, and he never lifted a finger to stop them. He would defend them. He would defend them and criticize us. Us! I was there the day he claimed to be greater than the temple. Then the rumors started. Rumors that he would actually destroy the temple. And the ignorant peasants he surrounded himself with believed him. Worse than peasants. Sinners. Tax gatherers. <laughs> Women. He told me about me. The part of me that... that shames me. But I didn't feel shame that afternoon. Before that day, I can't remember when I haven't felt shame. But that day, that day I felt alive. They knew we were coming. Now by that time, they knew every move we made. We didn't know who to trust. But that, that didn't concern him. So off we went into the jaws of the lion, Jerusalem and the whole world was waiting for us. They lined the streets. The sound of their shouts was deafening. And I'll admit, it, it, it went to our heads, but not him. He seemed preoccupied. I, w I would say worried, but I'm not sure that he ever worried. And then things got strange. He made Passover all about him. You know, he, he said the bread was his body and, and the wine was his blood. And we were used to that kind of thing, but, but this seemed more unusual than normal, even for him. Then he announced a new covenant. We had no idea what that meant. And then he gave us a new command. And we, we certainly didn't need any more of those. So, what was the problem? The problem? Jesus was the problem. The crowds loved him. The crowds flocked to him. 
And the crowds not only believed him, they were beginning to believe in him. That was a problem. So, we took care of it. You mean, you killed him? No, Rome killed him. Lucky for us, it was one of his own that led us to him. And once we had him, well, all the other peasants scattered, as we suspected they would. But let's be clear, we did not kill him. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I should have made him their king. I saw more courage, more integrity in those eyes than in the eyes of any of their high priests. They were jealous. Ask my wife. I tried to save him. But as soon as I mentioned king, we have no king but Caesar, they chanted. And in that moment, I realized I had no choice. And then I crucified their king. For the record, they are responsible, not me. It doesn't matter now. What matters now is that Passover is over. Things will settle down now. So... What do you do now? We hide. We wait. Didn't he say he'd be back? Yeah, yeah, he, uh... <sighs> he said a lot of things. More than you have room to write. He'll be back? Back? I don't know. I don't think so. Put yourself in their shoes. What are you feeling? Worry? Fear? Anxiety as a result of uncertainty. Isn't that true? Life's uncertainties always bring with it anxiety. I want to read to you the resurrection account in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked. The doors being locked. The title of my message, Behind closed doors, I think we can all relate to. And here's why. Where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. I wonder what is causing you fear, worry, doubt, despair, a moment of uncertainty in your life right now that's causing you to stay behind closed doors. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. He has to repeat himself because they're so terrified. I find it amazing that in the midst of their greatest anxiety and uncertainty, Jesus knows exactly what they need. They need his peace. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Where's Thomas in all this? It's somewhere else to be that was better. Did you go on vacation? Like, where, where's Thomas in this story? 
He was not there. And so verse 25 says, so the other disciples told him. So they later tell him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. You ever met a stubborn person? There's a reason why Thomas is called doubting Thomas. Think about how frustrating this would have been to the other 10 disciples who, who have seen the empty tomb, who have heard that Jesus is risen from the grave. He's real. This is real. The resurrection is real. And he's like, no, not going to believe. Not going to believe. My encouragement would be to just keep being prayerful and patient with those doubting Thomases in your life. He says in verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. You know, fear, worry, anxiety melts away in the presence of Jesus. Verse 27 says, then he said to Thomas, All right, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you. That's me. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's my prayer for you as you watch this message, as you experience our service online this Easter. Father, would you bless your word? Illuminate people's hearts so that they can see you for who you are, the Prince of Peace. As you say to us today, in the midst of our anxiety, peace be with you. Amen. It's amazing when you think about what's happening here in the gospel narrative. These disciples who had been following Jesus around for three years, just a week prior to this event, Hear the crowds shouting, Hosanna in the highest. And then all of a sudden, they hear, crucify him on the cross. Imagine, in just a week's time, going from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. That in a week's time, their whole reality was shattered in pieces as they went from Palm Sunday to Good Friday. Their lives were filled with worry and anxiety and fear, Much like right now, this world is filled with worry, anxiety, and fear. They had an outside threat. The Roman soldiers, the chief priests, it was open season. Jesus was first, now they're next. So they're hiding behind closed doors for protection, wondering what would happen next. We have an outside threat now too. We're all indoors in isolation and quarantine because of this virus, this COVID-19 virus that threatens so many people's lives. We've gone behind closed doors. For them, they were worried about their future. They had just given up the last three years of their life following this rabbi around. Imagine going to college for three years and then your professor is killed, the one that you kind of bought into and said, this is, where I'm, this is the field that I'm gonna go into. I need to learn from this person. And not only that, not only do you drop out, not only is the class canceled, but they're going to go after you and kill you. What are you feeling? Anxiety, worry, fear of the unknown. To make matters worse, these disciples had to go get a job now. Their job for the last three years was following Jesus around. Now these fishermen have to go back to fishing. Matthew, the tax collector, couldn't even go back to that. Because A, it was wrong, and B, there was a long waiting list. It was a very lucrative business. And then he gives it all up to follow Jesus. His future is in question now. And maybe yours is as well. There's people that are losing their jobs. The economy is turning downward. And people are worried about what the future is going to look like. But here's the thing. Uncertainty always brings with it anxiety. 
And if you're trying to live a life free of uncertainty, that's not going to happen because uncertainty is always a constant variable. That's the problem. We can't escape it. It's always there. And uncertainty, if we don't experience Jesus' peace, where he says, peace be with you, will always be a problem for us. And so the solution to our problem is not a life of less uncertainty. It's more of Jesus' peace in the midst of our uncertainty. See, in uncertainty, we all want certainty, don't we? That's why we check our news feed every day. When are my kids going back to school? When can I go back to work? When will this world go back to normal? We want a level of certainty. We want to know when the quarantine is going to end. But yet Jesus, instead of offering more certainty, doesn't even touch that. He simply provides his perfect peace in the midst of a life of uncertainty. And so here's the thing. It's possible It's possible, church, to have uncertainty without worry. And through the resurrection story that we're going to see today, we're going to learn how we can have peace. So here's the big idea. Jesus provides peace, but it does require our participation. Jesus provides peace, but it does require our participation. In fact, we see three ways that we can participate in Jesus giving us peace, in us embracing it and accepting it, receiving it, and living a life of peace. The first one is this. He tells us to go. He tells us to go even when it's hard, which it was going to be hard for these disciples. In fact, if you know the story in the New Testament, what follows those words is a life of anything but certainty for these disciples. They didn't have less uncertainty. They had more uncertainty. They were, they were sent out like sheep among wolves. And the only thing that was going to get them through that battle, the only thing that was going to get that through, through them, through the, them through that storm was not less uncertainty, but more of Jesus' peace in the midst of that uncertainty. And so, same for us. We can't have peace in our life if our lives are not aligned with Jesus' mission that he's given us. So, in the Gospels, we, we see in this passage that Jesus sends The Spirit empowers, and our job is to go. And as we go, we can go with peace, knowing that he will sustain us. So that's why Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You will receive the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus' promise in his peace, in his presence, going with us to get through, no matter what uncertain future we're walking into. So our peace is not tied to our circumstances. Our peace is tied to our Savior. So he tells us to go, which is ironic. I'm telling you to go, align your life with Jesus' mission, to go and to help be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's ironic, isn't it, to go when we're told to stay put. We're all in quarantine. We're all in isolation. But I'm so proud of our church for finding ways to be the hands and feet of Jesus, even from their homes. I mean, we have small groups that are leveraging technology. People that don't even know how to use a computer have found out how to use a computer, learned how to use Zoom so that they can stay connected with the body of Christ, so that they continue encouraging one another and fellowshipping with one another, even through video. We've done this through Facebook Live every Monday night at 7.14 p.m. as a church. We're praying for our church, for this nation together. And we've had more people a part of our prayer meeting online than we have in person. We challenged the church last week to write uh, cards, Easter cards for people in nursing homes or manors who can't go out or, or maybe they have loved ones who can't get in. And so they're going to be all alone this Easter. But today, because of your generosity, because you were aligned with Jesus' mission to be the church, people actually have encouragement through scriptures, through our kids who made all those cards, hundreds of cards that we were able to deliver this week to the nursing homes. Later this month, we're going to have the Red Cross host an event at our Greece campus, which I would have loved to have had Easter at the Greece campus this year. But isn't it awesome to know that even despite not being able to meet in person as a church and do the grand opening in Easter, they're still being the hands and feet of Jesus. And so it's still possible to go even when you can't go out. It's still possible to go even when we're told to stay put. So keep being the hands and feet of Jesus and align your life with his mission. The second thing that we see about participating in Jesus' peace is this. You need to forgive even when you don't want to. You need to forgive even when you don't want to. 
I think peaceful people are forgivable people. Resentful people become bitter people. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. I've heard that harboring bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Trying to be bitter and unforgiving towards another person, not realizing that you've offended almighty God, holy God, and he forgave you. How crazy is it that we would not then extend that grace to people that have perhaps offended us? That doesn't work. There will be no peace in our life if we don't have peace with each other. The peace that we have with God is related to us having peace with other people, being reconciled with our brothers. That's why we're told to lay down our gift at the altar and go make peace with our brother before we offer that gift. When we have communion, we're told to go make it right with our brothers and sisters before partaking in communion because this is such an important part of our participation with the Prince of Peace. So what do you need to do? Who do you need to pursue? Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to reconcile with this Easter? The third thing is this. The third way that we participate is that we need to believe even when we can't see. We need to believe even when we can't see. This is Thomas's dilemma. He wasn't there. The other disciples had to tell Thomas. And even then, unless he could like touch the hands and feet of Jesus, place his finger in Jesus' side. It says, I will not believe. He was stubborn. He needed proof. And maybe you just need some more proof. Maybe you need to wrestle more with the resurrection. That's fine. God is big enough for your doubts. He's big enough for your worries. And what I love about the story is that Jesus meets Thomas in the midst of his doubt. Jesus loves Thomas even in his doubts. If you know Thomas' story, he later on is martyred for his faith. You know that Thomas was so committed to Jesus. But it took some convincing. It took some proof. He needed to trace God's hand. So here's a question, church. What do you do when you don't have the luxury of Thomas? What do you do when you don't have the luxury of tracing God's hand? What do you do when you weren't there 2,000 years ago? You don't have the luxury of seeing the empty tomb. Here's what you do. When you can't trace God's hand, you can always learn to trust God's heart. And his heart for you is love, it's peace, it's mercy, it's forgiveness, it's grace. Unmerited grace that you did not deserve. He loves you and he wants you to hear that today. In fact, if you're a believer, you already know this grace. Let me remind you in the midst of your anxiety, in the midst of an uncertain future where you don't know what's going to happen, that you can have peace, not because what's in front of you, but because of what's behind you and who's behind you and what he's done for you. If you've lost your job, who gave you that job in the first place? He will get you through this. You have a church family that loves you and wants to help you. We we, want to pray for you. Right? He's going to get you through this. He's been faithful in the past. He will continue to be faithful in the future. He will not allow anything to happen without his permission. He is a sovereign God who's in control. This did not surprise him. You can take courage in knowing that. Even when you can't see, you can believe. You know, that's the whole purpose of John's gospel. John wrote this gospel with this purpose, and we read it in John chapter 20, verse 31. It says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the reality is that there is no peace in disbelief. There is no peace in disbelief. If you're trying to look for peace and have peace in your life outside of a relationship with Jesus, it's not going to happen. So Christ offers us peace, but it requires us to go, even when it's hard. It requires us to forgive, even when we don't want to. And it requires us to believe, even when we can't see. It's through him 
that we have this peace. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of my favorite parts of the resurrection story is before Jesus walks into this room, perhaps through the door that was locked. We don't know how he entered, but as he entered, their fears were distilled and peace was with them. Before that ever happened, you see a story that is surrounded by fear, surrounded by worry, surrounded by anxiety, surrounded by an uncertain future. You see disciples locked behind closed doors. You see Mary run to the tomb, see the stone rolled away, and was so distraught, so broken that she thought someone stole her Savior's body. She could not even comprehend that he would rise from the dead. The story goes that she looks inside the tomb and she sees an angel, one at the foot of where Jesus laid, one at the, the head. And they ask Mary this question. They look at Mary as she's distraught, thinking that someone stole the body, and they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? You know, I think they asked that question for a couple of reasons. A, they know what happened. They knew the end of the story. They, they, they knew the reality of the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection changed everything. They don't need to weep. They don't need to worry. You don't need to weep. You don't need to worry because Jesus is risen. The other reason I think that they said, why are you weeping, is because if you read in John chapter 20, verse 15, it says that having said this, she turned around, having said the words, where have they taken the body? She turns around and she sees someone. She sees a man who she thought was the gardener. The angels knew who that man was. So she turns to the gardener and she says, sir, if you've taken him, please let me know. I want him back. And this gardener looks at her and with one word opens her eyes. He looks at this woman and simply says her name, Mary. And right in that instance, Mary's eyes were opened and she said, Rabbi, and everything changed. She runs back and she tells the rest of the disciples about the risen Savior. Could it be that God is looking at you today in the midst of your worry, in the midst of your doubt, in the midst of your despair, in the midst of uncertainty that's causing anxiety. And he would call your name to the reality of the resurrection. That your eyes would be open to see who he is. That if you already know him as your savior, your eyes would be open to the fact that nothing is impossible with him. That he's bigger than your circumstances. And your worry should not be tied to your uncertainty because it's possible to have uncertainty without worry. It comes through his peace that he offers. It requires you to go. It requires you to forgive. And it requires you to believe when you can't see. But perhaps maybe you joined us online this morning not knowing that Savior. Not ever really wrestling with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the implication that it has for your life. Today, Jesus would look at you and would call out your name. And my prayer is that your eyes would be opened. That he is your Savior that you need. Your sin separates you from a perfect and holy God. That is why Jesus came to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and for your sin. And then rose again on the third day to prove his power over sin and darkness. So that you can be made right before God the Father. And he would look at you today and call you by name. Whatever your name is today. He would call you by name and your eyes would be open to the reality of your Savior. My prayer is that that would happen right now. And if you want to make that a reality, it would be my joy to pray with you right now. And so wherever you're watching online, maybe you're in your living room or your kitchen, if it's your desire to become a Christian, to follow Christ with your life and to experience salvation, 
and to walk with him for the rest of your life, then pray with me right now as I pray out loud. You can pray it silently to yourself, or if you want to say it out loud, you can. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for living a perfect life and dying in my place for the forgiveness of sin. Jesus, I confess to you right now that I've I've sinned. I've fallen short of your perfection. I'm ashamed at some of the things I've done in the past. Some of the things that I don't even want to speak of, but you know. So, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of those sins. I recognize today that you did prove your power over sin and death, conquered the grave, defeated my sin so that I could be made pure and righteous. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. And I ask you to give me the strength and power to me to live on mission for your kingdom cause from this point forward. That I would proclaim, just as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Friends, if you just prayed that prayer with me, would you do me a favor? You you could just type it in the chat that you received Christ as your Lord and Savior or in the comments on Facebook, or you could email us at info at crosstownalliance.com and one of our campus pastors would love to follow up with you this week. We might not be able to meet in person, but we can celebrate online that we have new family members in Christ because he saved someone today. That is our hope and our prayer. Amen, church? Amen. As we continue with our worship service this morning, let us celebrate the good news that we have in Jesus that he is our Prince of Peace, that in the midst of our fear, our worry, and our anxiety, he stands in our midst and declares, peace be with you.